Hello, friends, and welcome to worship at Cokesbury United Methodist Church. I'm Rebecca Fetzer, one of the pastors here. We're just so delighted that you could join us for this time together. The flowers that you see on the altar were from the service of Karen Haywood Sawyer, who passed away this past week. We want you to know that there are many graduates from Cokesbury, and one uh, group that is very important is our college graduates. We have Sarah Beth Bales, who is receiving her master's from UNC, and Bailey Alexander, who's getting her degree from UT, and Maria Urias, who is Marcelo's daughter, is getting her, uh, her degree also from UT. So we're very, very proud of all of our graduates and hope that you will congratulate them when you see them. Now let's worship together.
Let's join our hearts and minds together as we pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise you, not for what you have done for us, but simply for who you are. You are creator of all things. You are the son who saves us. You are Holy Spirit who convicts and consoles us. You are the presence who surrounds us. God, we are grateful to be able to celebrate this Pentecost. We pray that you will send a fresh wind and a passion for ministry that we may continue to love all generations into a relationship with you. Baptize us anew with your spirit so that we may remember your plan for us as a church. We pray today for those who may be sick or afraid or in mourning. To all, grant your healing and peace. Surround us with your steadfast love and may that love flow out of us to people around us. It is in your name that we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. i 
Welcome again to worship at Cokesbury Church. I'm Anna, one of the pastors here, and we're so glad that you're joining us. And I'm especially glad because today we are beginning a new series called Focused. We've had lots of things going on in all of our lives and in all of the world in this last year. We wanna take this week and the next three weeks to get focused on some of the things that are going to help us as we continue in our walk with Jesus, as we continue to grow and take next steps each and every day. Today, we're going to begin by talking about getting focused on the need to attend. Now, I don't just mean attending church. You're already doing that, so you're doing great. There's more to it than that. We're going to be talking about the idea of showing up, of being present, of engaging with our life in a way that's meaningful and leads to the growth of our faith and the growth of the body of Christ. If we've learned anything in the last year, we have learned that we desperately need one another, that we need community. For the first few weeks of the safer at home period, I found myself on church days, whether it was Sunday morning or Wednesday evening, I found myself at home with my husband and my children and we were watching worship together. And for a minute there, I thought, you know, I could get used to this. This is kind of nice. And we would have our little time of worship together and that was a wonderful thing. But as the days turned into weeks, turned into months, I started to look around my life and realize the void that was there because of all the relationships that I wasn't able to attend to in the same way anymore. The people from work, the people in our neighborhood, our family members, so many of you in our church community. I was staying in touch with FaceTime and text and email and all the great tools that we have, but it just wasn't the same. There was a day that my in-laws came to our yard and they set up lawn chairs on the yard and we all visited. And my husband, Chris and I, I don't think we stopped talking the entire time they were there. We were so excited to have human interaction, to have contact with other grown-ups that we could talk to them about what was going on. And it's because what we realized is that community and our ability to be with one another is so much a part of the wonderful things of our life. One thing we learned about church is that something we used to say a lot, but we understood finally as true, is that the church has never been about the building. The church is not this place where I'm standing. The church is all of us. The church is the body of believers. And we've stayed connected through worship like this. We've stayed connected through being in mission and ministry together, through serving our community, through praying for one another. But even with all of those wonderful tools, I've, I've missed the community of believers coming together. And that pang that we felt in our heart over the last year, those, those moments of isolation, those times when we just feel alone, that's loneliness. That's a feeling of loneliness that so many of us have felt in being physically separated from one another. One evening a few months ago, I was going for a walk and I took my phone out and I called one of my best friends. And that doesn't sound remarkable, except that my friend and I are both moms. We both have little kids. We have jobs and spouses and all of the things that fill up our lives. And we don't often make the time to talk on the phone. We'll get together for lunch or we'll send each other messages. But I made a phone call. And when she answered, I could tell immediately she thought something was wrong. She said, hello, how are you? Are you okay? And I said, oh, oh, it's okay, it's okay. There's no problem. I said, you know, if I'm really honest, I'm calling you because I'm lonely for my friends. I'm lonely for the people that I love. And she said, you know what, me too. And so I walked and we talked and we had this moment of connection. When those feelings of loneliness rise up, we realize that we are made in, to be in community with one another. We're not made to face life alone. We're made to be in connection. And loneliness can be a pretty serious problem. Can cause a host of health problems. There's numerous studies that have been done on this topic, one of which showed that babies who are not touched or cuddled or held enough actually stop growing. Some of them even die. They're not able to live without the physical human community and connection. Later on in our lives, studies have shown that college freshmen who have a social network of peers that they interact with, whether it's a club or um, a group organization on campus, some kind of sport or activity they do, those college freshmen are less likely to develop anxiety and depression in its most severe forms than they are their peers who don't have that connection. Because the way we process and go through life is as a community, is as a group of people together. 
Loneliness can lead to shortened life expectancy in the same way that things like high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart disease can. Loneliness. You wouldn't often see that written on a label of risk factors for things that could impact our health, but what we know to be true is that we have a physiological and a psychological and a spiritual need for connection with each other. Each of us are created in the image of God. And our God is a God of connection. From the beginning of creation, God chose to be in relationship with humanity, with Adam and Eve from the very first day. And then as we read in the scriptures, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of our Christian faith, is God incarnate with us. The Son of God sent to be God's presence to us in the world. You may remember that one of the names for Jesus is Emmanuel. And that means God with us. Jesus is God incarnate, God in the flesh. We worship an incarnational God, a God who knows that we're flesh and blood people and we need a flesh and blood connection. If you've ever read anything about church history all the way back to the beginning of the Christian church, one of the things you'll find is that unfortunately Christians argue and they argue a lot. Oftentimes, the way that goes is that someone will bring up the sort of standard Christian viewpoint. Somebody else will come in with something that seems contrary to that. And then there's this push and pull and studying and praying and sometimes arguing to figure out what is it we really believe. And many good things have come from that. We've learned to hone in on the most important things. There was one such conflict that came up in the early church with a group called the Gnostics. Now, the Gnostics believe in a dualistic world. They believed that the material world and the spiritual world were separate, that they could not combine. Thus, the Gnostics rejected the incarnation of God. They thought that Jesus, as God, had to be just an illusion, that there's no way that God could have really been human in the form of Jesus because the material and the spiritual just couldn't come together. Now, as the early church wrestled over this issue, they ultimately decided that that was heresy, Because at the heart of what Christians believe is that God is with us. God has been with us. God will be with us. The message is a paraphrase of the Bible. It's wonderfully helpful. Um, You can find that online or buy a copy of the message. It sometimes just helps bring some of the scriptures to life for us. But the message shares the famous verse from John chapter, chapter 1 with us this way. It says, God put on flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I love that phrasing of it because what we know about the incarnation is that presence is key to knowing God. From the very beginning and from Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we know that God says presence and attendance, engagement in flesh and blood is important. And it's how we're going to know God. Today we're celebrating Pentecost. The birth of the church, it's often symbolized by the color red, which you'll see behind me. Jesus had been on earth with the disciples and many other followers, and he had been teaching and preaching. And then he was crucified, he died, he was resurrected. And then he spent some more time with those people before he went to heaven. And before he did, he said, I promise you, I'm not going to leave you alone. I promise you that I'm sending one to be with you forever, the Holy Spirit. He promised that this gift was coming. And in Acts chapter 2, we can read about that day. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, tell us that when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. I don't know if you noticed that at the beginning of that scripture, it said the Spirit came when they were all together in one place. The Spirit wasn't delivered to them with two-day shipping to their doorstop. The Spirit came to a community of people. The group received the Holy Spirit together. And that's why we've got to stay focused on attending, on tuning in for worship, on being here when we can, on connecting with the Christians around us because we attend to get filled up. There's power in showing up for one another. There's power in getting around and staying connected to other people of faith. There's power in getting around the message and the good news of Jesus. If you want more hope, you've got to get around the hope of Jesus. 
If you want God's word to get into you, you've got to get around God's word. If you want more faith, be around people of faith. This last year, every Monday, I have taken my four-year-old daughter to my mom's house for what they call Nana Pre-K. My mom used to be a kindergarten and second grade teacher, so she knows all about that world of early childhood education, and she's been so wonderful to share that time with our daughter as she prepares for school next year. So every Monday we drop her off and they're excited and they get out all the school supplies and they have their day of learning and adventure. But then in the afternoon, I go and pick her up and I scoop her in my arms and we hug and cuddle because we've been apart for the whole day. And every Monday afternoon, my daughter smells like my mom. You know how the people that you love have this distinctive smell and you can't put your finger on it. It's some mix of maybe a candle that they like to burn or the soap that they use on their hands or maybe their shampoo, some combination that makes this beautiful smell that represents a person. And every Monday afternoon, I can smell that smell in my daughter's hair, on her clothes because they've been together. It's the same way with the body of Christ. When we are around the body of Christ, when we engage with other believers, we take on the scent of Jesus Christ, the aroma of faithfulness and patience and hospitality and forgiveness and grace and all these wonderful things that we want to continue to grow in our relationship with Jesus. That happens because we get together and we share those characteristics. We get filled up with the fruits of the Spirit. We get encouraged. Sadly, I think we've made a little bit of a mistake in the church. We talk all the time about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and rightly so because it's so important. But what we mean when we say a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we mean that God cares personally about you. We mean that as Jesus died and was raised from the dead, Jesus was thinking of you, did that for you, knows you intimately, loves you completely. But sometimes the mistake we make with that is we start to think that a, instead of a personal relationship, what we actually have is a solo relationship. We start to maybe assume that all we need to follow Jesus is just us and God, it's just me and God till the end, which just us together. Well, certainly God is with you personally, loves you and knows you, everything about you. But Christianity was never meant to be a solo sport. Christianity is a team sport. The early church knew that and that we needed one another. That while our faith is deeply personal, it's lived out in community. That's the truth of the body of Christ. And when people sometimes drift from God or from faith, maybe you have, I know there have been seasons when I have, it's not usually just because of one thing. When we start to drift, it's usually because we stop attending. We stop engaging in exactly what we're doing right now. We, we, we drift. We stop making the effort to attend. It's the same with our marriages and our family and our groups of friends. If we don't put the time and the energy and the effort into connection, those relationships will start to drift. So we attend together to get filled up with all of the wonderful gifts of the Spirit. And in the letter to the Hebrews later on in the New Testament, we get a glimpse of what it was like for those churches in those generations that followed for how they were trying to show up and be connected to one another. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 23, we read, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching, the day that Jesus will return. We saw in Acts 2 that we attend to get filled up. And then in this Hebrews passage, we see that we also attend to pour out. It's this constant both and that we are getting around the body of Christ to fill up and that we're getting around other believers also to pour out. I've always found it interesting when people come to church or when they watch a worship service and sometimes you might hear someone say, you know, I didn't really get anything out of that. I don't really think that did anything for me. I didn't get anything. As though church only exists to meet our needs. We certainly do worship and connect with each other to get filled up and that's wonderful, but we're also here to pour out. It's not all about us. 
We pour out our praise to God as a community. We're here to pour out to God our thanks and our praise and our worship. We also come together to pour out encouragement to one another, accountability, challenge, hope, faith. We're here to pour those things out for other people. One of the things I've loved in this year of worship with many of you online is seeing in the chat how you connect with one another and how someone might say, I I love prayers for this situation in my life. And other people chime in on the chat and say, I'm praying for you. Hang in there. Don't give up. That's because we attend to pour out. We attend and we come together so that we can be a place of encouragement and hope for one another. If we detach from our community, if we see ourselves starting to drift, we can accidentally build just an echo chamber for ourselves where we just surround ourselves with things or people or voices that are exactly like ours so that even eventually the voice of God starts to sound suspiciously like your own voice. And then you start to realize that you've limited yourself to one viewpoint. I have 10 cousins on my dad's side of the family. There's many of us, it's, it's loud and exciting when we come together, but we are a range of ages. And I am one of the older cousins. I'm, I'm on the front end of this group. Well, just about a year and a half, two years ago, all of the girl cousins got together for the first time ever just to get away and spend some time together. And we did it without the grown-ups. Now, we're all grown-ups, but what we meant by that was none of our parents were invited. None of the aunts and uncles and grandparents. It was just the cousins got together. And we started, of course, as you do, to tell stories about our childhood, about experiences with our grandparents. And what was interesting is that those of us who were older had some different memories than those who were younger of the cousins. We realized that the same event through the lens of different people in our family was very different. And we laughed together about how maybe the older ones of us got treated a little differently than younger ones who got away with a little bit more maybe. And we had a great time realizing that even a memory, even something as personal and real to us as something that we remember, when you just turn the prism and you look at it from someone else's point of view, you realize maybe there was more to that day or that event than I could see. The same is true with our understanding of Scripture and our understanding of God. That if it's only ever me and God, I'm seeing only God through one lens, through one perspective. I read the same scripture over and over again, and I'm limited by my perspective, my experience, and my understanding. But when we start to let the community of God, the body of believers, help us to read scripture and listen and interpret God together, what we realize is God is so much bigger than what we could ever know on our own. We start to see reflected in the people around us, the image of God that we've never even noticed in ourselves. Part of how we know God is by seeing and hearing and understanding God through the Spirit alive and working in other believers around us. If we're going to be serious about living and loving and following a God of the incarnation, a God who is with us, then we've got to get serious about showing up with and for each other. It means that if we're going to be imitators of Jesus, of Emmanuel, of God with us. We've got to start reflecting that to other people. The day of Pentecost, the reception of the Holy Spirit is an important reminder of the presence in this world of the body of believers and what the body of Christ is capable of. Your presence in this body of believers is vital. You bring something to this community of God that no one else does. You have unique gifts and talents and skills that we all need, experiences that we may not know. Your presence in this place is so important. You show up to pour out. You show up to offer encouragement and support and love to one another. To help each other meet God by being Jesus to one another each and every day. My challenge to you today is that you take some time to pray and ask God, what is your next step in attending and being present in this one incredibly precious life we've been given? Who is it that you need to connect with on a personal level? What card do you need to write? What phone call do you need to make? What meal do you need to drop off? Who do you need to show up for to be Jesus in person? To make a human connection with someone else, to say, God sees you and so do I and you are not alone. 
Let's take those next steps together today. Let us pray. God, we come to this time of worship as individuals in our own spaces, in our own spheres of influence. But as we come to worship and to praise you, we realize that we are just one part of a huge body of believers. God, open our eyes to see the vastness of your love that exists even beyond our own relationship with you. God, give us the courage to take this step forward, to attend, to be present, to be the reflection of Emmanuel, God with us, so that those who are lonely and hurting and hungry for your word of hope can feel your presence through our presence. It's in your son Jesus' name we are always praying. Amen. Thank you again so much for joining us for worship. If you are worshiping with us for the first time, we're so glad that you did, and we hope you will join us again in the future. And we also hope you'll share this worship service with others who may need a word of hope today. God bless you, and we hope to see you very soon.